Well, as you see, everything is there on the board. Thank you for the nice introduction. And yes, I actually brought some aviator sunglasses because that's the first thing I heard when I got this assignment, you know, and I think, no, man, now I have to buy some of these, you know. But I actually already did because I bought these in 1992 when I started my pilot training. This was something that you needed to have back then. And, uh, yeah, I went to the German equivalent of the uh, Top Gun uh, training. So... Uh, um, by the way, who has not seen the movie? <laughs> oh. 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 I thought this was a prior assignment to this. Come on. Sebastian, you missed the task. Yeah, but, I mean, that's not a big problem. Anyway, but uh, referring to the movie, the movie has some very interesting uh, things in it. Um, we have a rule. And the rule is you need to have at least a 10% amount of truth in every story that you tell. <laughs> and that is the same with the movie. Let me tell you what, I, what I'm going to do this morning. I'm not going to tell you how you need to do your job. Because I couldn't. Because I don't know how you do your job. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to tell you how I had to do mine. So if you think that people flying these airplanes around, they all need to be super athletes or super smart. Um, from my own experience, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, I know for sure that I'm not a super athlete and I'm not entirely very smart. So, pressing on, uh, let me tell you a little bit about fighter pilot, let's say fighter pilot culture. You have to have a certain attitude. You don't start in pilot training with this attitude. They teach you this attitude, otherwise you're not going to finish the program. Yeah, you have to be aggressive. You're not selected as a team player. You're not, okay? You have to be self-confidence. We're a little rebellious. We're a little rowdy, you could say, maybe, yeah? Um, and we're competitive because we want to be on top of the schedule, you know? We want to be on top of the list. Um, but we have this little something that I didn't have in school. I'm totally honest with you. In school, I was just the one that I'm just jumping over the bar, you know, just, just so to make it, and then I'm going to go out and party. If you do this as a fighter pilot, you're not going to get very old. Okay? So that's not working. So you have this attitude of wanting to be good. We believe in performance. So if you want to gain respect in the squadron later on, you only gain respect by performance. It doesn't matter where you come from, how you look like. I mean, you're going to size up when you're the new guy. This is nothing unusual. You know that too. I mean, that's what we do, right? But uh, if you are a woman fighter pilot or a guy, right, if that woman fighter pilot or the lady fighter pilot is a better fighter pilot than some other guys in the squadron, that's just the way it is. And that's how we recognize and that's how we respect it. We respect performance. And that's why you want to be good because you want to be respected amongst your peers. That's why you have this desire to be good. But this concept lives on through aviation, a fighter pilot aviation, uh, for over 100 years. And we call this the concept of mutual support. And to be honest, this concept is not only working... Um, in the fighter pilot squadron, you know, it also works uh, out there in every organization that I've seen. But I think now it's time to go fly, right? That's what we're here for. Okay. Well, before we go fly, we have, need to do a couple things. Okay. Um, first, we need to go plan. Okay. That's the boring part of it, to be honest. Um, we're not going to get too much detail here. Uh, because planning can be anything from 15 minutes to a day. Of course, we are planning for success. We want to fly a successful mission. But what we do after the planning, I think, is much more important than the plan itself. But there's one other thing why we go brief, and that is briefing for failures. We need to prepare ourselves for all the things that can go wrong. So you have to be prepared for your contingencies. And we're not going to call it a plan B because I learned, I learned from a study that if you have a plan B on hand, you're already given up on plan A. Okay? Now, we're not giving up on plan A. We're still executing the plan. Okay? 
but we have planned for things that can go wrong to still be able to complete plan A. What keeps you alive in the air is something that we call situational awareness. Now, how can you influence situational awareness? Well, the best starting point is to go into the aircraft prepared. And it's a good idea to have a little bit of altitude underneath your belly. You know, if you have these two things, things are generally going pretty good. Now, this is normally the state that you can see in student pilots that they switch their brain off. You know? And that's the state what we call as instructors when the student is fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> fat, he's relaxing, so he's like, oh, you know? Dumb, because he doesn't know what is going on, but he still feels pretty good about himself, you know? And that's really deadly. To be honest, we in the German Air Force, that's what we were really good at. When we went on deployments, flying with the U.S. guys with all their fancy machines, we with our 20-year-old tornado, man, they were surprised what we could do with this thing because we had our brains switched on. <laughs> you know? Now, what about errors? To be honest, there is room for error. There is no no-error mission. There is no perfect mission. Every day I try to fly the perfect mission. It never works, but you get closer every day. Now, if a pilot forgets to put down his landing gear, you know, you can cause a lot of damage, right? and that's not good. Now, they make you run around a whole week with this wheel as a handbag. <laughs> You're going to take this thing everywhere. You know what? And it works. It works. Yeah? I did it one more time then, but then it worked. Now, after we land and head back to the shelter, shutting down the engines, it's time to go for the bar, right? Not yet. Not yet. We go to the bar afterwards. No? But not now. It's just facts. There's no names. Okay? It's not personal. That's why we call this a nameless and rankless debrief. Um, and I've actually seen squadrons uh, in the briefing rooms having a little Velcro tab there in the in the door, because that's why there's Velcros on these name tags. We literally take off our names and our ranks and we put this on the door before we enter the room to make this a reality, that this is a nameless and a rankless debrief. And at the end of the day, we need to have some lessons learned to take back it to the next sortie. Because the next sortie is already starting at the point of the debrief. Uh, trust in your team, trust in your people, believe in excellence and set a standard, take over responsibility and protect your people. Before you be a leader, you need to be a wingman first. So I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.